creator of all creation. We are so grateful that you have permitted us access to your presence once again. Thank you for the gift of faith that allows us to engage in sweet communion and intimacy with you. We're grateful for the love that you have shed abroad in our hearts that generates an intimacy among us. We're grateful for that sweet intimacy. We're grateful for your sweet presence. We're grateful for your provision. We're grateful that we find ourselves not in lack today. And whatever we may be lacking, you have more than enough for us. We think about those that are suffering this morning, this, this day, this evening, whatever time and whatever part of the world where there is suffering. We feel for those individuals that suffer without the knowledge of your love. And we know those that suffer with that knowledge do not suffer the way that those that suffer without that knowledge suffer. As Paul said, we have a great hope. And if the love of God were to be false, we would be among men most miserable. But we are not miserable because the love of God is not false. Your love for us is not false. It is real. It is the realest thing that we have. Renew our minds, transform our bodies through the faith that we have given to you, through the faith that we place in you. Our gift given back to you, the gift that you give to us, we give to you. Faith in your name and your word. And as your word goes forward, let our hearts be prepared to receive it. Let our minds use it to grow your kingdom here on earth. Be glorified in us and through us, Lord God, our strength and our Redeemer. In Jesus' precious name, amen, amen. Again, family of God, we're so grateful, we're so thankful that you have taken some time out to join us here for another Sunday session for Connecting. We appreciate it. We don't take it for granted. We don't take your presence. We don't take your time, your investment of time, and those of you that, that do invest monetarily. We don't take your monetary, you don't, we don't take your monetary, uh, excuse me, um, possessions um, lightly. We are, we're grateful for them. We're grateful for them. Um, so with that, grab your Bibles. We're not going to go to scripture immediately. I'm going to actually read something to you. I'm going to read um, a psalm, uh, if you will, a poem. Uh, maybe you'll recognize the author. Maybe you won't, but I'm going to read this poem, and then we're going to jump into God's word for us today. And the poem reads, I have found thee to be more honorable than all the treasures of this world. Thou art the Lord of my great supplication. And in my despair, I declare that I should not be moved. In the bitterness of my deepest valley, I chose thee to serve forever. What favor have I found in thee that thou wouldest restore all unto me? And so, and I, am I, am I so valuable to you? that my meager happiness brings you joy. Dost thou delight in the joy of one so small? Dost thou pleasure in the peace of my soul? Yea, I say my God is the God of my sore despair and my great joy. The Holy One of Israel, the Lamb that was slain before the whole world, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Anointed One, Thou which was not created, the beginning and the end, Thou which hung the earth on nothing, the Word become flesh and dwelt among us. In Thee, O Lord, Jesus Christ, precious Lamb of God, in Thee alone do I find my joy. My mother and father fail, wife and child fail, friend and sibling fail, but Thou, O God, Thou hast never failed. In the valley I declare that I will not be moved, and from the mountaintop I will stand upon your word. For when all else passeth away, you are God. This is a poem that I wrote, oh, some <laughs> 20 plus years ago at this point, um, uh, in, in a very 
difficult and dark season of my life, I wrote this poem and declared my love for the Lord through the anguish and bitterness of that season. And because it was in that season, I began to, began to experience an intimacy to God's love that I had not experienced previously. And so that leads us to today's message. Today's message is love does produce intimacy. The last couple of weeks, we've been looking at some characteristics of love and what love does not. Love does not hold hostage. Love does not terrorize. Love does not come cheap. That there is a cost to love, that there's a vulnerability to love, there's a compassion to love. And so this week, as we continue to explore the characteristic, the depth, the power of God's love, we say love does produce intimacy. Love is not distant. God's love is not distant or impersonal. It reaches the very depths of our being. God's love offers us comfort, assurance, and a sense of belonging. And so we will look at the intimate nature of God's love in Scripture. We did provide the Scriptures in the text feed. Uh, if you have the text feed, you'll see the Scriptures there. Let's begin with Psalm 139. A bunch of Scriptures um, uh, 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 that we're going to pull from to illustrate this intimacy. Before we begin, though, let's, let's parse the word intimacy for a moment. My former pastor, Lamar Belcher, Pastor Lamar Belcher, uh, I often called him Bishop Belcher, Bishop Lamar Belcher, um, would, would say that intimacy could be broken down. You could pronounce it and, and reword it a different way, into me, see. That, that intimacy could be broken down into me, see, as in you see. When you are intimate with someone, you see in them, you see past the outer facade. There's a connection, there's a deeper connection that exists within someone with whom you are intimate. That into me you see, into the, the, the hidden parts of me that I, that I hide when I am intimate with someone. There are parts of me that I hide from others that the person with whom I am intimate is given access. There is a connection. There's a bond. There's a pairing that happens in intimacy, we often equate, and it is very much a part of intimacy, is the romance, is the physical connection of intimacy, the, the physical bonding that happens as a part of intimacy, but intimacy goes beyond romance and physical bonding. It's certainly a part of it, but it's not the only Part of it. You can have an intimate friendship. You can have an intimate relationship that does not feature romance. It does not feature physical bonding, at least physical bonding in a romantic connotation. That you can have an intimacy, you can have an intimate relationship that's not based on romance, but it's based on a, a knowledge of the innermost parts of the other individual. Now we have in the 20th and the 21st century sort of grown, particularly here in the West and the United States specifically, we've grown to this place where uh, we have related intimacy with romance, that those things have become almost synonymous. And I, I want to say to you that while that is true, there is intimacy that exists outside of a romantic setting. If you grab your Bibles, let's start in God's Word, Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. Now we know that there is the, the, the verb to know, 
uh, that it is often translated as a as a, a romantic no, as as uh, Abe, Adam knew his wife Eve, and Eve begat Cain. That there is that sort of intimate, that romantic, that physical knowing. This is a different knowing. You have searched me and known me. That is that inner, the inner parts of me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and you are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. There is a connection that God desires. There's an intimacy that God desires with us as believers, with us as his creation. I and 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 I think this is something that that you can relate to perhaps is there are uh, there are absolutely moments, there are moments, there are times where I can look at my wife uh, sitting on the couch, sitting at the kitchen table, wherever, wherever it may be. I can look at my wife and she doesn't have to say a thing. I can look at her. She can look at me and I know what it is that she's thinking. I know what it is she needs, what she's looking for. That's that's the kind of intimacy that God is talking about. And that doesn't happen without time and relationship building that that doesn't exist uh, with with colleagues of mine that it, a co people that I could have worked with for years that intimacy that deep knowledge is is reserved for a stronger connection it's not just about the time that you spend together, but it's the nature and the quality of the time that you spend together. And so there is there is an intimacy. It 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 sometimes it will happen from a parent and child relationship, but again, not necessarily the same way. It will happen on very close friendships. Some of you have very, very close friendships, a best friend, your day one, right? Your, your, your homie back in the day, know you better than anybody else type of situation. That person can see you, can look in your eyes and know what you're thinking, know what it is that you're about to say before you say it. This is what God desires. This, this, this love that produces a kind of intimacy where God knows our thoughts beyond the omniscience, beyond the omnipotence, beyond the omnipresence. God wants to know our thoughts because of the time that we spend with God. That quality time, that quiet time. Do you give God the first of your day? Do you wake early enough to give God 10, 15, 20, 30 good minutes of reflection and contemplation? Do you give God time during the day, throughout the day, where you turn the radio off, you turn the podcast off, and you just allow the presence of the Lord to fill you and allow your thoughts to drift toward your God and your creator? Do you give yourself away to God? Are you intimate with God? Psalm 23, you know it well. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God tenderly cares for us as a good shepherd cares for its sheep. There's a, there, there's, there's a, a gentleness, there's a tenderness, there's a kindness, there's a warmth. I shall not want. I shall not lack. 
I shall not feel alone. That's, that's another way to say this is I shall not feel alone. Because God is there leads me in the paths of righteousness so that God's name will be glorified. On green pastures beside still waters, there's this, this beautiful evocative image of a pasture and, and a river running through and the grass is lush and soft, and you can just imagine God leading you through this clearing into this lush, green, crystal blue water stream where you can rest and you can, can drink and, and be nourished and fed. And there's this warmth and this deep connection, this fulfillment that comes from God's intimate love. And, and I know that we're familiar with, with some of the more romantic expressions of love in, in, in scripture, particularly in Song of Songs. Song of Songs, this isn't written in the chat, but he just let me read it to you. Chapter one, Song of Songs. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for his love is better than wine. Chapter 1, verse 2. Chapter 1, uh, 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 verse, uh, verse 8. If you do not know, O oh, most beautiful among women, follow in the tracks of the flocks and the pastures of the young goats beside the shepherd's tent. I compare you, my love, to... A mare among Pharaoh's chariots, your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. Chapter 2, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young women. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. There is that romantic element to an intimate love with God, but it goes beyond romance. Chapter 2, verse 10 through 13, Song of Songs, my beloved speaks and says to me, arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away, for behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. There's this invitation, this tender invitation that God extends to his beloved to 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 embrace the newness of life, that the harsh season of winter, the desolate, the cold, the barren season has ended. Come into my love and experience the newness of my love. Experience the spring of my love. Enjoy the beauty of creation. That this is, this is God's invitation to us, inviting us into a deep, intimate, personal relationship that God wants us to come into God, to experience that innermost part of God. There is something waiting for you and I in faith. There is an intimacy that God desires. There is a vulnerability that God desires. God wants to open himself up that you and I might go in and experience a deep, abiding, intimate love. That comes with time and connection, and worship. Song of Song, chapter 8, 6 through 7, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. 
For love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. It flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. That love is, it, 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 it's beyond calculation. It cannot be purchased. This kind of love, the kind of love that God is offering cannot be purchased with money. It's so strong. And I love, look at the, the, the description here. Look at the imagery that love is a flame and waters cannot quench it. I love to grill. This is grilling season. I love to grill. I love charcoal. I love old school grilling with charcoal bricks and, and the round uh, a drum of the grill and 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 kind of scraping the grill and 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 putting your food right on the grill and getting that smoky flavor from the bricks. I love grilling. And when you're done with the grill and the bricks are still hot, you just you pour a little water over the grill and 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 the bricks go out. And that's that. What God is describing here is his love is a fire that is unquenchable, that you douse it with water and it does not go out, that God's love, that intimacy is not quenched. It does not go out. It cannot be drowned in the flood. It cannot be quenched with, with water. It cannot be purchased. You could sell all your possessions and it's still not enough. Isn't it good to know that your God's love can't be bought? Because if it can't be bought, guess what? It means it can't be sold. That it's got to be earned through time and connection. That I know imagery, and, and I've referred to God even as, as we prayed, I referred to God as our Redeemer, that 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 word redemption to redeem uh, redemption does have a have have a a a transactional connotation there is sort of built into its meaning this idea of an exchange and and we we talk about how Christ did purchase us on the cross on Calvary Christ purchased us but to to be clear that alone doesn't give you access to God's intimate love. That Christ's death alone, because we know Romans 3 verse 8 said, while we were still sinners, Christ died. That Christ's death was, was for those who believe and those who do not believe. That Christ's death was not contingent on you and I believing. Christ gave his life whether we would believe or not because... We are worth it because we're worth it. And so whether we accept the gift that, that Christ's love purchased us, Christ's death still happened. And so Christ's death alone does not grant you intimacy. Your faith and your belief in Christ's death and your acceptance of Christ's spirit, of Jesus' spirit, that's, that's what grants you access. That's what welcomes you in to the presence of the Lord. That's what gets you intimacy. John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. God's love was so strong that it became flesh and it dwelt among us. And it's God become flesh. It's the person of God, the Son uh, uh, in name Jesus that represents, that illustrates God's desire for intimate connection. God is so fascinated with us. God is so smitten by us. God is so 
drawn to us. God is so crazy about us that God put on flesh to experience what we experience to deepen, <coughs> excuse me, to deepen our connection, to deepen our bond. God became flesh to experience humanity that God's love would be grounded in a more intimate reality, having experienced directly what it is to be human. Same book, John 15, 9 through 11. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. This is Jesus talking. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. That my joy would be, listen to the language that, that if you keep my commandments, my spirit, I will reside in you as the Father resided in me as I kept the Father's commandments and these things I've spoken that my joy be where? In you, that your joy may be full. That the language, the love language of, of God and Jesus for you and I, the intimacy is all about being in drawing into us that we might be drawn in to God through Jesus. There is a bond that God desires beyond superficiality. God is so not impressed with trappings and, and, and with, uh, with outward uh, uh, displays of, of splendor and and grandeur, not that God is opposed to those things, but what God desires is intimacy. Of all the ways that Jesus could have been presented to the world, Jesus was presented through a teenager and a carpenter in a cave laid in the feeding trough of animals, heralded to the world by angels and shepherds. Jesus didn't ride to Jerusalem on a stallion with a crown atop his head and a sword on his hip. <clears throat> he rode into Jerusalem with children singing in palm branches and cloaks on a mule. Jesus is not impressed by external splendor, pomp, and circumstance. Jesus wants intimacy. Jesus wants to know our deep thoughts and affection. Jesus desires what's real. And what's real is what's on the inside, what not can what, what not that which can be arrayed on the outside. What can be arrayed on the outside can pass away. I'm not gonna have this on tomorrow. I'm not gonna have this on an hour from now. But what's on the inside, that's what God is after. What's on the inside is not gonna change an hour from now. It's not gonna change tomorrow. What's on the inside is what is permanent. It's hidden, it's safe, it's secured, it's tucked away, and that's what God desires. Miss Queen, God wants to be on the inside. Because what's on the inside lasts. Let's wrap with this. For I am sure that neither did Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing will be able. Do you understand that you would have to cut me open to separate my heart from my body? That you cannot just simply take my heart from my body. That, that the love of God is designed to go so deep that, that what we can experience in the world cannot separate it. We read in Psalm that, that the fire, or in Song of Songs, that God's love, that fire cannot be quenched with water. It cannot be drowned in the flood. It cannot be purchased with great wealth. That nothing shall separate us from the love of God. It doesn't matter how high we go. It doesn't matter how low we fall. That nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Good days, bad days, uh, 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 rain, sunshine, snow, blizzard, tornado, earthquake. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. If we're on the waters, thou art there. If we make our bed in heaven, thou art there. If we descend to the pit, thou art are there in seasons of much, in seasons of little, in seasons of prosperity, in seasons of poverty, thou art there. There's an intimacy that God is after, and love produces intimacy. God's love is a profoundly intimate personal and tender experience. God's love does not hurt. Family of God, I, that's the other thing that I want to get into us as we wrap up, as we conclude this Sunday, that God's love does not hurt us. Oh, but Charles, we talk about sacrifice and, 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 and look at what the disciples endured and look at Look at what they went through for the truth and, and, and what it meant to declare truth. Absolutely. That was people doing that. That wasn't God doing that. That was people persecuting the disciples. That was not God doing it. God's love may cost, but God's love does not harm. God's love is tender and sweet. And the disciples were able to endure and early Christians are able to endure. And Christians today that live in persecuted lands and persecuted areas are able to endure because of God's love. Because they are experiencing that intimacy, that deep connection, that deep abiding connection. that comes with time, that comes with connection, that comes with care and attention. And this is exactly what God is looking for. Open your hearts. Open your hearts to experience the depth of God's intimate love. And let's respond to this invitation to abide in God as God would abide in us. And that abiding, that resting, that living, that dwelling comes from God's word. Spending time in God's word is how the commandments get into you and the love and the joy get into you. As Jesus said, God's spirit is in me because God's commandments are in me. And if my commandments are in you, then I am in you. And if I am in you, then my joy is in you. And my joy is in you. My father is in you. Open your hearts to the father's love. Will you pray with me? If you are brand new to 
this faith and this experience. Will you pray with me that you might receive God's love? And to receive God's love, you just simply need to ask. To ask with the expectation that it will be given. That's what faith is. Faith is anticipating receipt without any evidence of confirmation. Faith is belief that when you say the words, there will be a response, not because you can see it, not because you have any experience, but because you believe that God will respond. Pray with me, Lord God, we need your love. We don't just want it. We need your love like we need our necessary food, like we need water and shelter. We need your love. And so now, right now, we open our hearts to you. We risk the vulnerability of our innermost being because we know that you will hold it and you will treasure it. Lord, there are those that are watching this that do not know you, but they're ready to start. For those of you, pray these words. Lord God, I am a sinner and I have fallen short of what your love has made available. Forgive me for a life that was focused on me. Starting now, I focus my life to you. Thank you for the gift of Jesus that you sent into this world. Jesus, live in me. Let your word live in me. And I will live for you. I accept the gift of your Holy Spirit. I believe that you died on the cross, that you were buried, and Jesus, you rose three days later to give me the intimate love of your Holy Spirit. And I receive that Holy Spirit now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, family, we rejoice and we celebrate with you Scripture tells us that all of heaven rejoices over one, just one sinner who repents, who has a change of mind and turns their life toward you and uh, toward God. And if you did that, then we rejoice and we celebrate with you. We're so grateful that you have spent another Sunday here with us at Sunday Sessions for Connecting. We pray that you experience the intimate love of God. We pray that throughout the coming days and weeks that you risk the vulnerability of opening yourself up to experience that intimacy that David described in the 23rd Psalm, you are my shepherd, my God, and I have no wants because you lead me beside still waters and you restore my soul. Family, if you haven't stopped by our website, I encourage you to do that. It's myconnectedchurch.com. You can fill out an information card there. You can help us stay in touch. You can donate to the ministry uh, as well. Uh, we always respect, uh, always appreciate and accept monetary investment and partnership as we continue to grow this word, as we continue to grow this platform. Uh, if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please go ahead and do that. We're on youtube.com. If you search My Connected Church, you'll come to our YouTube channel there. Um, you can subscribe. You can uh, click the notification bell. So every time we go live, every time we update or add something new to our channel, you'll get those updates and notifications immediately. And of course, um, like the video, share the video. Don't keep this to yourself. Let somebody else know about the good work that God is doing at My Connected Church. Until the Lord God would see fit to join us together once again, stay safe, stay healthy, stay in this fight for your faith. God bless you, family.